for them, I think, to find a way back into some sort of dialogue with the Palestinians would be desirable. But at the moment, there is no Palestinian leadership, I fully recognize that, which is capable of delivering that on the Palestinian side, nor is there the mood really in Israel, of course, at the moment for that. And above all, there is no real international pressure uh, um, to push this forward. And the international community is so fractured at the moment. Uh, obviously, the Russians are uh, set against the Americans in the region. You referred in a, your earlier uh, interview with uh, James Cleverly to the Chinese who have a role in the region, but there is no concerted international pressure at the moment or engagement on this issue of the Israeli-Palestinian problem and a diplomatic solution to it. Let's speak to the former uh, head of the Foreign Office and Diplomatic Service, now the manager of Flint Global's, Sir Simon Fraser. Simon Fraser, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Good morning. Hi. Can we go back to basics? The, the basic situation of Israel and Palestine, uh, leaving out historic Zionism, I suppose we can really look at that in terms of nations and borders and 1948. What happened then? Well, first of all, I think it's really important that you're having this conversation and that, you know, while we're all caught up in the tragedy of the moment, we do think about the broader issues because we've got to, at some point, to face up w where this is going to take us. And you do need to understand the history of this uh, to understand what's happening. Um, it does go back, actually, beyond 1948, Adam. I think, in a way, you have to go back to 1917, to the Balfour Declaration, in which the British government sort of said that it favoured the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine, while at the same time saying that nothing should be done which prejudices the civil and religious rights of other of other inhabitants of Palestine. And that is the nub of the problem, the sort of paradox which we have been grappling with since then through the very you know, tragic history of this dispute, which is freighted with tragedy and um, uh, a sense of uh, damage on both sides throughout, throughout, men, you know, throughout a cent more than a century now. But in nineteen forty, sorry. And then, of course, there was the Second World War, and and there was the Holocaust, and that really energized yeah. the idea of of a Jewish homeland. But of course, it created a great moral responsibility for all of us uh, towards the Jewish people, and it created great pressure on uh, for for movement uh, of, of of Jews into Palestine, and the British mandate which was being exercised under the League of Nations, sort of crumbled under that. So in 1947, the British abandoned the mandate. And then there was the war in 1948, which was the war uh, in which Israel established itself as an independent nation, was subsequently recognized as such in the UN. But one of the great tragedies of that war was that about 700,000 Palestinians were displaced and became refugees. And then, of course, that sowed the seeds for the ongoing uh, conflict and confrontation which we've had since. Why, why did the Jewish homeland have to be in Palestine? Uh, well, that was something which goes back. I mean, obviously, <laughs> there's history in, in, in that, in, in religious history, going back into uh, to the Bible and to the beliefs of the Jewish people about, you know, um, their, their homeland being in that part of the world. Um, and it was something which, as I say, was recognised in the Balfour Declaration by the British government, which was then the mandated power. So I think it was an established idea long before 1948, uh, and that is why uh, that that is what happened, and that is why Israel was established as a, as an independent state in that part of the world. Now, of course, Arab states in particular were not happy with the establishment of Israel after the Second World War, and then. We had the first conflict in 1967, or the first yeah. major conflict, no, known as the Six Day War. What happened then? Well, in the Six Day War, I mean, the Israelis fought a very successful campaign against the neighboring Arab states, uh, primarily uh, uh, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, and occupied the West Bank uh, and indeed Sinai, the whole of the Sinai Peninsula, including the Gaza Strip, which, of course, is where we are focused at the moment. This is in response uh, to them being attacked? This was, uh, well, it was in response, actually, it was in response to a perception that they were going to be attacked. I mean, I think it was a preemptive 
action by Israel in 1967. Uh, but again, as a result of this, they were almost more successful than they expected, and they ended up occupying the West Bank and Sinai. Uh, and then there was a very rapid peace, uh, or truce was then declared, and Israel ended up occupying these territories, which were um, deemed to be illegally occupied by Israel. And again, there was a great displacement of about, I think, about another 400,000 Palestinians out of the occupied territories, uh, and notably the West Bank. And that, of course, has been a bone of contention ever since. The occupation of those territories has not been recognized as legal in international law in the UN uh, by most countries, including actually the UK and most Western governments ever since that time. And then in 1973, and we can hear a little bit of a news report from them, came the uh, Yom Kippur War. It is an all-out war. That's how Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Dayan describes an invasion of the Golan Heights and the east bank of the Suez by Syria and Egypt. The surprise attacks came early this morning in the air and on the ground. All day today, Israeli reservists have been heading for their units. The streets have been full of military traffic. In fact, the big call-up started last night. Arab forces had been building up for 10 days, and intelligence indicated an attack was imminent. Tom Brokaw there of NBC News anchoring that report. Now, what did the Yom Kippur War, uh, Sir Simon, what did that change? Well, it was a, it was a, 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 Israel was taken by surprise uh, in an attack by uh, primarily the Egyptians, but also other neighboring Arab states. And there was a great moment of uh, risk for Israel that they might be, they might suffer a very considerable military reverse. In fact, during the fighting during that war, Israel reversed that situation and in the end managed to stem that attack. But what it really did for the first time, I think, was bring home the potential vulnerability of Israel. And, uh, uh, and that led to a sort of change in the psychology. Uh, Egypt was able to uh, subsequently to re re regain the Sinai in the uh, Camp David agreements, which sort of followed a few years later, uh, sponsored by President Carter, in which Egypt made peace with Israel uh, under, uh, at that point, Prime Minister Begin. Uh, and that was because I think the Israelis realized after the Yom Kippur War that they needed to find a way of stabilizing the position with the neighboring Arab states. And there was then, subsequent to that, there was the recognition of, of the Palestinian Authority by Israel, and there were the so called Oslo Accords, which were reached and, and which, frankly, I'm going to hear Bill Clinton now, engenders a sort of great move of optimism. Throughout this century, bitterness between the Palestinian and Jewish people has robbed the entire region of its resources, its potential, and too many of its sons and daughters. The land has been so drenched in warfare and hatred, the conflicting claims of history etched so deeply in the souls of the combatants there that many believe the past would always have the upper hand. Then, 14 years ago, the past began to give way. Now, Sir Simon, those sort of optimistic uh, feelings, those hopes were dashed. What went wrong this century? Well, I mean, the, the Oslo Accords flowed from the first Palestinian intifada in the late 1980s. And the re realization, I think, by Israel then that they needed to find an accommodation. And then, as you say, there were these negotiations which led to that agreement in 1995, uh, which was a sort of framework for peace uh, in which the Palestinian Authority, as you say, was recognized and established in the West Bank. What went wrong? Uh, the great tragedy of this point was the assassination in November 1995 of the Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin, who had been a great war leader for Israel, but had come to recognize as prime minister that a two-state solution was in the long-term interest of Israel uh, and indeed of the Palestinians and had led that uh, diplomacy. But after he was assassinated, it unraveled. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the Palestinian leadership was undermined. Uh, more extreme positions were taken on both sides uh, you saw the establishment, you had already seen the establishment of Hamas 
uh, on the Palestinian side, subsequent Israeli governments under Prime Minister Sharon and more subsequently Netanyahu took more extreme positions. And that moment of peace that uh, of the mid 90s, I'm afraid, was lost. Sharon did, of course, uh, end the Israeli occupation of Gaza. He did. I mean, uh, he again was another f uh, former general who, uh, as prime minister, I think, began to realize that uh, despite he, despite the fact that he had been responsible for some very hardline Israeli positions, notably the invasion of Lebanon in 1982, he recognized that actually occupying Gaza and indeed being on the ground in Lebanon was unsustainable for Israel. So he was looking to withdraw, but he withdrew from Gaza, but there was never significant momentum after that behind what you might call a real peace process for between Israel and the Palestinians. The last serious effort at that was actually under John Kerry when he was US Secretary of State, which ended in 2014. And for the last decade, frankly, there hasn't been any serious effort to address this issue. And I think what we're seeing today is probably almost the inevitable consequence of that diplomatic neglect of this long, long, long running problem. It is, of course, as you say, a dreadful situation and, and, and bloodshed on, on, on both sides. Do you feel that after this particular conflict uh, it reaches some kind of ceasefire, that there is a hope for renewed diplomacy or not? Well, I think we're a long way away from that. Um, I think what this does, uh, as I say, what this does show us is that there is no real uh, peace and stability in the region that doesn't address the Palestinian issue. And the US and other diplomacy, which is focused on the relationship between Israel and the Arab states, sort of bypassing the Palestinians, uh, is not going to solve this problem. And I think when the Israelis look at this, one can fully understand you know, their determination now to take very strong action against Hamas. But Israel will also have to ask itself the question, where does this all lead? And particularly if there is, you know, great civilian suffering and, um, uh, you know, an outrage against that, um, that sort of reduces the Israelis' uh, options for future diplomacy. So for them, I think to find a way back into some sort of dialogue with the Palestinians would be desirable. But at the moment, there is no Palestinian leadership, I fully recognize that, which is capable of delivering that on the Palestinian side, nor is there the mood really in Israel, of course, at the moment for that. And above all, there is no real international pressure uh, um, to push this forward. And the international community is so fractured at the moment. Uh, obviously, the Russians are uh, set against the Americans in the region. You referred in a, your earlier uh, interview with uh, James Cleverly to the Chinese who have a role in the region, but there is no concerted international pressure at the moment or engagement on this issue of the Israeli-Palestinian problem and a diplomatic solution to it. So Sam Fraser, thank you uh, very much indeed for being with us.